Shane Harris is a, a great friend, a great reporter, great author. Um, I strongly urge you, if you don't, haven't already, uh, to visit our book stand in the back here and uh, buy two or three copies of this book because <laughs> this book is something that anybody who's interested in national security today uh, should be reading. Um, Shane and I wrote this book together over many lunches at the Palm. Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, no, but the book, the book is, is excellent, at war. Uh, and I know you came here to hear from Shane and not me, but I do want to say a couple words about my friend Shane Harris. Um, many of you know Shane as uh, the Daily Beast's newest national security reporter. Um, if you don't read the Daily Beast, you should now because some of the best stuff on national security is coming from the pages of the Daily Beast and Shane Harris. Uh, prior to being at, at the Daily Beast, Shane, of course, was at Foreign Policy, uh, where we all followed him religiously in his work. Uh, I know Shane even before that, though, when he was at Washingtonian and National Journal, and he's always worked on uh, substantive issues in Washington in a way that both we can understand them and also understand the complexities. Um, so I, you know, Shane's always been, I, you know, I, I don't like to say who all my favorite reporters are, uh, but Shane has always been at the top, top, top of the list. And when I knew that this book, when I found out that this book was coming out so soon, I, I you know, I, I emailed him frantically over Thanksgiving because I was at home and my, uh, my, my, my in-laws in Cleveland downloading um, a book by a guy named Walter Isaacson who writes about technology occasionally. And it was great because all of a sudden, I'm on the getting ready to find Walter Isaacson's book. Well, At War pops up out at me. And I thought two things. One, Shane's book publisher is really good, and I'm glad that they're promoting his book that well. And two, I better get on the horn quickly and be the person to, uh, you know, get Shane to, to uh, uh, launch his book, his Washington uh, book launch here at CSIS. So without further ado, I'm honored. Uh, and it's my pleasure and it's the pleasure of my colleagues at CSIS to welcome Shane Harris. Thanks, Andrew. He wants you to buy two or three copies because he's getting a cut, in case you, in case you couldn't tell. Um, thank you very much for that introduction, my friend. That's uh, very, very kind of you. And it really is um, it's a privilege and an honor to be here uh, at CSIS talking about this book, uh, in particular because CSIS has done, I think I don't have to tell you all here, but just for those of you who don't know, really tremendous, groundbreaking work uh, on cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, uh, has some of the best minds and thinkers um, here under this roof on this topic who, for me as a journalist, have been invaluable resources uh, of analysis and insight. Uh, you'll even see some of them reflected on the pages of this book. So thank you to uh, CSIS and to Andrew. Um, well, what I thought I would do tonight is talk uh, a bit about the book uh, and kind of give you a sense and a flavor of sort of the main arguments and the themes, but also try and tell you some of the stories that are in here. I mean, I, I, I tend to write in narrative style, and my goal as a journalist is to really use stories and clear language for unpacking and, and, and deciphering very complex topics, uh, frequently about technology. Uh, and certainly cybersecurity is one of the more complex and opaque uh, domains, not least because it's shrouded in so much secrecy, uh, which maybe we can talk a bit about in the Q&A of how I actually went about reporting a book like this. Um, but obviously, whenever you get into talk of technology, uh, people's eyes can start to kind of roll back in their head, and it seems very distant and remote. Um, but not so, I think, with cyber warfare and cyber security and cyber espionage and uh, certainly stories that have been coming to the fore even the past few months uh, after the book came out, I think with the uh, revelations about North Korea hacking Sony, now people are starting to understand what a, what a really common event, frankly, a lot of these sort of acts of espionage and, and cyber aggression are. Um, so with that sort of a setting the stage, I mean, I, I, would, I would point to a couple of things that officials have said recently to try and reinforce the degree, U.S. officials, to which 
cybersecurity really has become sort of the dominant national security priority for the Obama administration uh, and for our military intelligence officials. Uh, Admiral Mike Rogers, who runs the National Security Agency and is the head of something called Cyber Command, which is a fairly new military command, recently said in testimony that the threat of a major attack against U.S. infrastructure, that is people hacking into the computers that control things like our power grid and our communication systems, was in his words, not theoretical, that hacking attacks on U.S. networks were literally costing his words hundreds of billions of dollars each year and would have, quote, a truly significant, almost catastrophic failure if we don't take action. And he testified about this publicly before the Congress not too long ago. Um, the risk of a catastrophic cyber attack, particularly on infrastructure or the banking system that would cause real damage and potentially even loss of life, has topped the intelligence community's list of global threats for the past two years. James Comey, the director of the FBI, who's been speaking a lot about the Sony hack lately, said the risk of cyber attacks and a rise in cyber-related crime to include espionage and financial fraud will be the most significant national security threat over the next decade. This is the director of the FBI, an organization that has been largely fixated on terrorism as the national uh, priority, now saying cybersecurity is potentially even trumping that. So how did we get to the point where our officials were making these dire public predictions and saying you have to pay attention to this, the point where the President of the United States is coming out and publicly blaming North Korea for attacking against a U.S. company and then imposing sanctions, maybe even shutting the internet off in North Korea. We're still not sure who did that. Um, this book tries to get at that question of where this came from and what gave rise to it. And, and I start in the, in the beginning uh, with a story that I'll relate to you now that goes back to the summer of 2007. Um, you have to imagine sort of at this period of, you know, not so long ago, uh, the idea of companies being hacked and foreign governments stealing secrets was still a fairly novel concept even for people in the national security community. And there was a really telling anecdote that I used that sort of is the moment where the light bulbs and the alarm bells really start going off in the Pentagon about this in particular. Uh, so in the summer of 2007, senior defense officials called up uh, several of the CEOs and their representatives from the major defense contractors in Washington. So we're talking about companies like Lockheed, North, uh, Lockheed Norton, North of Grumman, Boeing, really sort of household names, the, the companies that really are the military industrial complex, uh, if you like, and said, you need to come over right now for what was billed as a threat briefing. So you can imagine all these CEOs being brought together at the Pentagon, they're ushered into a secure facility, a skiff. You know, leave your cell phones outside. You're going to be hearing some really scary stuff. And they go in and they're given a presentation about how hackers, presumably in China, have actually penetrated a huge number of computer networks in the United States, gotten inside them, overrun them, and are exfiltrating or stealing large amounts of data off those networks. Well, it turns out the networks are those of the CEO's companies. And that these hackers were actually after military technology and secrets, particularly about one of our major weapons programs, the Joint Strike Fighter program. So what they find out is that rather than go through the front door at the Pentagon or the Air Force, these hackers are making an end run and going and attacking the companies, the contractors, which have much lower security than the Pentagon has on its networks. So this comes as a revelation to many of these CEOs who I think up to that point really did not have much of a concept for how vulnerable they were uh, and just how much data was being stolen. And as, was, as the meeting was described to me by one person who's familiar with it, a lot of these people went in with dark hair and when they came out it had turned white. This was really scary stuff. So the Pentagon says to these, these folks, um, you are essentially the weak link in our security chain right now. We have a problem, you have a problem, therefore we have a problem. And the way that we're going to fix this is you are going to start to ramp up the security on your networks, but also you're going to start talking to us about the threats that you're seeing. You're gonna tell each other what threats from hackers you're seeing. And moreover, we are going to start sharing classified intelligence with you about what we know about hackers and how they operate. A really extraordinary moment where the government is essentially saying to private enterprise, we're going to share with you the fruits of espionage to protect our stuff and by extension, your companies. It's a really dramatic partnership that takes hold in that moment. And, and I like this story because it, it kind of epitomizes what the current national approach to cybersecurity is. And it's really in very broad strokes all about trying to persuade companies, which control the data, which control 85% of the network infrastructure in this country, to do a better job protecting themselves. Uh, the government cannot go out and easily protect 
all infrastructure, all information, all companies in the United States witness the fact that I think the NSA probably had some general idea about the threat that Sony was under, but probably the FBI and other agencies were powerless to step in and do much about that or chose not to. Rather, what the United States has done is to go out and say to companies, you are the essential part. We have to form a partnership here. And that is how we are going to collectively start to con control and to protect what we know as cyberspace. Um, that little meeting that started in the Pentagon that I talk about gave rise to a partnership known as the Defense Industrial Base Initiative, or the DIB, which many of you may be familiar with. And it started small, and it's grown to about 100 companies today. And it sort of, again, epitomizes this approach of this public-private partnership, which is a term that gets often overused in Washington, but here it has real meaning. We're talking about sensitive and classified information moving between the government and private enterprise. This model has been expanded uh, to the point that now the government is sharing what's known as threat signatures or classified information about what we know about how, co uh, how countries are hacking, how groups are breaking into networks. The government is now sharing that with some internet service providers in the hopes that they will use that information to protect their customers and their consumers downstream. Um, big marquee tech companies, including Google for one, have formed partnerships and agreements with the government to share information about hackers. Google actually in 2010 was overrun itself by Chinese hackers that stole some of its intellectual property. It notified the State Department that it was going to go public with this, and the day after it did that, formed an agreement that is still classified with the National Security Agency that we know is sort of a kind of cyber threat early warning system where both sides are trying to inform each other and talk to each other about the threats that they're seeing. So defending cyberspace, and also frankly attacking in cyberspace, which is what a lot of this book is about, has become a cooperative effort between government and the intelligence community and some of its partners in the technology industry, some of them willing, willing participants, some of them being legally compelled to do so. And this is what I'm really talking about when I get at the subtitle of the book, The Military Internet Complex. It's sort of this, and I'm hearkening back deliberately to President Eisenhower, both from the descriptive power of that, saying the military industrial complex, and also the warnings that he was trying to issue about the enormous power that can be coalesced here. But that's what we're talking about here, is these powerful military and intelligence forces on one side and big technology companies and the people running the backbone of the internet on the other coming together for this kind of collective arrangement for defending all of us, really, in cyberspace. Um, now, I mentioned that this happens, it starts to gain energy around the end of 2007, um, which was sort of remarkable because for years, people in the government had been warning about uh, these threats. Uh, after 9-11, very quickly you started hearing from people like Richard Clark, a name that may be familiar to many of you, who had been one of the few voices warning about Al-Qaeda. Um, Dick started jumping on the cyber thing very quickly after 9-11, saying, this is the other thing you need to be worried about. Um, but it takes some time, and I think part of the reason for that is, you know, not to be unkind to President, uh, to President Bush, but he was not necessarily the most technologically savvy of chief executives that we've ever had. He liked to say that he used the Google occasionally to look at satellite photos of his ranch in Texas. Um, not that his predecessor was any more uh, uh, technologically inclined. Bill Clinton, it's been reported, sent only one email during his entire time in the White House, and of course he was there when cyberspace was almost more of a conceptual notion and it was, it was still developing. Um, so, it's really when Barack Obama takes office that this whole sort of national defensive approach to cybersecurity really starts to gain steam, um, which is not surprising. I mean, Barack Obama was arguably the first, you might say, internet president. Um, he deployed the internet to great effect for fundraising and campaign organizing. Um, he was hacked while he was on the campaign trail, as was John McCain, spies believed to be again in China, penetrated their campaign email systems and were trying to, to spy on them and get to know what they were doing. Um, when he came in with his BlackBerry, which he famously had with him on the uh, campaign trail, uh, intelligence officials sort of had a freak out when he informed them that he wanted to keep it. <laughs> and as uh, I was at a conference this past weekend where Mike Hayden, the former CIA director and NSA director, was talking about how they took this BlackBerry and sort of had to open it up to put in all of these new security features that it was going to take to protect the commander in chief. And they were nervous about whether they should tell him um, how many foreign intelligence agencies they suspected might already have targeted him um, while he was the candidate. Um, so Obama comes into office getting this. Uh, and um, CSIS played a role as well in preparing for him uh, a big report on the state of cybersecurity for the 44th presidency. Um, it does not take him long at all 
to really make this sort of the centerpiece of what his national security priorities are going to be. Uh, in 2009, in May 2009, he held an event in the East Room of the White House, which is really where you convene the really big heavies when you want to unveil a major policy initiative. And he was there to unveil his comprehensive approach to national cybersecurity uh, and to really make a statement, I think, almost more than anything. Um, and he got up and did some really extraordinary things. One, he talked about the fact that he'd been hacked on the campaign, which had been reported, but now he was acknowledging it in a very public way. Um, he also came up and said uh, that the power grids in the United States, and particularly the systems that control electrical power in this country, had been probed by foreign hackers. He did not say who they were, but for a president to get up and say this, to say that our system is vulnerable and we know it because they're already inside, was extraordinary. For years, people have been reporting on this. People like me and others have been whispering about it as something you dare not say it publicly, that the Chinese or the Russians had found ways to get in and possibly turn out the lights. And here was the president of the United States saying this. And then he talked about the fact that, in his words, the vast majority of our critical infrastructure in the United States is owned and operated by the private sector. And he said, we will collaborate with industry to find technology solutions that ensure our security and promote our prosperity. Now think about this. We're going back to this idea of this public-private partnership. The President of the United States coming up and saying there is an interest in collective security and prosperity in, pro in promoting and protecting cyberspace, and that we're going to do this by partnering with industry. He declared that the internet was, a, in his words, a strategic national asset and that it was time to protect it as such. So the president in this speech, and, and frankly even like President Bush before him at the end of his term, is starting to describe cyberspace as a domain, as a battlefield, as something that is, requires government intervention and protection um, from foreign intruders and invaders. The military has now adopted this terminology and calls cyberspace the fifth domain of warfare after land, air, sea, and outer space. Um, you know, I think it's a maxim that we're all familiar with in Washington. If you want to get a sense of where the priorities are at any one time from a policy perspective, you follow the money. And if you look at the defense budget in particular, where the priorities for cybersecurity are, are massive, and it's really the only part of the defense budget that's growing uh, with any consistency, it tells you a lot about how the military and the intelligence community is viewing this as a domain of warfare. So for 2014, this is a data point here, the, the government planned to spend more than $13 billion on defense, cyber defense programs, mostly just to protect government computers and networks and to share intelligence with private industry. Now, that doesn't account either for the offensive component, which I'll talk about in a bit. To put that $13 billion figure in perspective, in 2014, the government plans to spend $11.6 billion on direct efforts to co combat climate change, which Obama once called the global threat of our time. So we're spending more just on cyber defense in this limited area than we are on direct effort to combat climate change. The 2012 Pentagon budget had the word cyber in it only 12 times. The 2014 budget had the word cyber 147 times. It's becoming a, a term of art that is so widely used, in fact, uh, that the chief official in charge of uh, uh, cyber policy at the Pentagon recently joked that he's seeing a lot of requests coming across his desk uh, with the words things like cyber tank and cyber airplane stamped on them. Because if you just mention the word cyber, they'll fund your project. So government officials have, have talked a lot lately about the ways that we're vulnerable and the ways that we're at risk. And this is all true. And it, you know, to be cynical, I suppose it has a way of drumming up support for new funding. And um, defense contractors are talking more about this a lot because we're not building missile systems as much as we used to. And, and you've got to pay the rent somehow. But this leaves out a whole separate part of the discussion, which is, to my mind, really the more fascinating and interesting one and hard to get at, which is the offensive component uh, of cyberspace and treating cyber as a battlefield, as a domain. Um, I tell a story in the book that I think starts to get at how we're integrating cyber warfare into traditional warfare and frankly shows the ways that we have become really, really good at it and how it's really being used, I think, um, to great effect to change the tide uh, of, of not only how we fight, but the outcome of some of our most important battles. Um, this also, also goes back to 2007 and the war in Iraq. Um, we'll all recall that it, uh, at that time, President Bush ordered tens of thousands of additional combat troops to Iraq as part of what was called the surge. And the goal here was to essentially stop Iraq from spiraling into a civil war and to put down the insurgency uh, that was gaining tremendous momentum there and uh, through the use of suicide bombs and IEDs. 
uh, and really uh, threatening to just undo everything that we had tried to accomplish in the previous four years. It was a very do or die kind of moment. Uh, and we were there, of course, battling Al Qaeda in Iraq, which we all know now today is ISIS, who we were having trouble with again. So the other component of this, the lesser known, the secret component that was not talked about in national speeches was a cyber warfare component. Uh, intelligence officials persuaded President Bush that now was the time to unleash the capabilities of the National Security Agency, which is home to our elite best offensive cyber warriors, our best hackers. And the idea here was to completely take control of the communication systems in Iraq for intelligence purposes. So what does that mean? The NSA built a program built a, a technological infrastructure, if you like, that was able to intercept every phone call, every email, every text message, every electronic or digital communication in Iraq at the time, essentially to own the network of that country. And what did it do with all this information? Well, it turns out that if you have access to the data on who is calling who, how long they're talking, the frequency of those calls, you can start to build a very illustrative and detailed map of who matters in a particular organization. Who are the bosses? Who are the foot soldiers? Who are the intermediaries? Who are the couriers? With that information, cyber warriors from the NSA teaming up with ground combat forces and our elite special operators were able to start mapping out the insurgency, the networks of suicide bombers, of roadside bombers, who their, uh, their foot soldiers were, who was financing them in foreign countries, all from looking at this technological, what you would call metadata. Um, I write it in the book about, a, uh, at the time, a, a young army lieutenant, a guy named Bob Stasio, uh, who had studied physics when he was in college and got recruited into the army through ROTC and joined the intelligence program. And Bob was one of these guys who deployed to Iraq and started mining and crunching the data that was available to them in the country. Um, he was a big fan of the HBO series The Wire, which some of you may have watched before. And there's a character in The Wire who is this sort of old, grizzled police detective who decides that rather than going out and walking the beat and trying to find out who the drug dealers are in Baltimore, he's going to start crunching their phone records. He's going to start mining all of the records and the burners, the cell phones they throw away, and start building a network. Bob Stasio kind of wanted to be that guy from The Wire, and he was, and he was really part of a vanguard of what I think are legitimately called cyber warriors who were going out, taking this intelligence, and then handing it off to combat forces on the ground who would then go out and, for the most part, arrest these people and, in some cases, uh, uh, finish them off. Um, these guys did some really other remarkable things, too. Um, they found ways to penetrate the cell phone network so that they could send fake text messages to insurgents posing as people they knew and then lure them into traps. They penetrated chat rooms and websites and implanted spyware, such as unwitting terrorists would be on these boards thinking they were talking to each other, but really downloading programs that sent all their information back to the NSA. This was really extraordinary intelligence gathering on a national scale in practically real time that was feeding information from these cyber networks to people on the ground who then went and followed up with the information. And it has been credited by no less, frankly, than David Petraeus uh, for being the primary driver for what helped turn the tide of the war and uh, was success well, the reason that the surge succeeded. Petraeus actually said, I'll quote him, that this intelligence-driven warfare was, quote, a prime reason for the significant progress made by U.S. troops in the surge, and in his words, directly enabled the removal of almost 4,000 insurgents from the battlefield. Um, I go into great detail about this in the book, but I think it's safe to say that the sort of the hidden secret weapon that helped turn the tide of the war in Iraq was a cyber war. Iraq changed the way that the NSA spied and the way the United States is fighting wars. And what we see now today is that cyber is kind of taking its place alongside conventional warfare. It's no longer this domain of the geeks or something we should have shunt off to the side. The military is trying to integrate this into the way that we fight future battles. And so are our adversaries as well. Um, the North Koreans actually gave us, I think, a fairly good indication of the value that they're placing on cyber offense with the Sony hack. Um, but there's some cautionary aspects to this advance. I think in its zeal to dominate cyberspace, the government, in partnership with co cooperations, is actually doing a lot of things that are making us all more vulnerable in cyberspace, which is exactly the opposite of what they want to be doing. So I'll, I'll talk about two examples here. Um, one involves the use of encryption, which if you're not familiar with encryption, basically what we're talking about here is just a way of scrambling your data when you send it over the internet to make sure that it can only be viewed by the person who, for whom it's intended. 
And encryption is great for privacy. It's great for securing your banking transactions. It's also really good if you're a money launderer or a drug dealer or a terrorist and you want to make sure that the FBI or the NSA can't read what you're writing. Well, understandably, the intelligence community, and particularly the NSA, wants to be able to unencrypt as much data as it can. It's a code-breaking agency. But in the process of doing that, we know now from some of the Snowden revelations, there have been occasions where the agency has fundamentally, uh, and you could argue whether this is deliberate. Some people have argued that it's not. We, don't have, we can get into that more in the Q&A. But intentionally inserted elements into encryption standards that are widely used by the public that fundamentally weaken them in such a way that the NSA would be able to decrypt that information if it intercepted that. And the NSA has been known on at least one occasion to have promoted the adoption of a particular encryption algorithm that people in the agency knew had been weakened and did not say anything about that at the time. Um, when you, this is sort of the equivalent of the government telling everyone in the public to go out and buy a particular kind of door lock and to put it on the front of your house because we reviewed it, it's a really great door lock, it'll keep all the bad guys out, except we're not telling you that we have a key to unlock the door. Oh, and by the way, it's not a particularly well-hidden key. A really devious burglar could probably figure out how to build one himself. That happened with encryption, and I think it's something that the agency probably regrets having done uh, and that we now know about because of the Snowden revelations. But here again, an example of in trying to treat cyberspace like a battlefield and prepare that battlefield to fight, you're lowering the defenses for the rest of us. Um, another area is the agency's practice of going out and accumulating what are known as zero-day exploits. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, basically this is you know, the building blocks of a cyber weapon, you could call it. Um, Technology that we use every day, whether it's on your phone, your computer, is full of software, your operating system is, is full of lines of code, which may contain vulnerabilities, may contain weaknesses. And a good hacker will be able to find out where the weakness is that the manufacturer has not discovered yet and build what's known as an exploit to go after that, that, that sort of a chink in the armor, a way into the system that no one has discovered. It's called a zero day because there are zero days to defend against it. Well, the NSA is the biggest acquirer of this information. It finds it through its own research. Uh, it pays for it from security researchers, also known as hackers, on a sort of online gray market. It has contracts with defense contractors to go out and acquire this information. And it needs that to have the building blocks of its offensive cyber mission. Well, arguably, if you are in the business of trying to defend cyberspace, which the NSA says publicly that it is, you might think that you should disclose those vulnerabilities rather than hoard them. And this has actually become a very big policy debate in Washington right now. Should our intelligence agency, our biggest intelligence agency, be more in the business of hoarding this information or disclosing it? And how do you strike that balance? And how do you know when you've got that right? The, uh, the, the president was actually given a recommendation by uh, and a panel of advisors that he convened after the Snowden leaks to say, how could we change intelligence gathering? How could we change our cyber posture? And one of the things that they recommended he considered doing was essentially to split this offensive and defensive mission within the NSA so that it didn't face this policy conundrum of how do we know when to disclose information about weaknesses in our networks versus when do we hide them? Um, he didn't take their advice. Uh, so we are still sort of, I think, going down the path, generally speaking, with uh, offense sort of taking the lead ahead of defense. All of this that I'm describing, you know, including the, the decisions that we make, the, the, the operations in Iraq, uh, all of this has basically happened with no public debate. Uh, this conjunction of a huge war fighting machine with a growing technology industry is, I think, as President Eisenhower described, the military industrial complex of a previous generation new in the American experience. And it's changing fundamentally how we all use the internet. Cyberspace, I argue, is too vast and it's too pervasive and too important to how we live to allow a single entity to govern it or to dictate the norms of behavior. And I argue that this authority should not be vested inside an intelligence agency or solely within the military. And it certainly shouldn't be shrouded in as much secrecy as it has been for many years. There's no neat way to define cyberspace, and, and I don't arrive at a conclusion for that in the book. Uh, it's not a commons, but it's also not private. We've come to depend upon it like a public utility, as we do electricity and we do water, but it's still mostly a collection of privately owned devices when you really come down to it. Yet cyberspace is undeniably a collective, which is why I think it's incumbent upon everyone who touches it, all of us, to take a stake in how we treat it, and to hearken back to President Eisenhower to find what he called in his farewell speech, quote, essential agreement on issues of great moment, 
the wise resolution of which will better shape the future of the nation. So thank you for listening, and I'll be happy to take your questions. I think we'll have some microphones circulating, but uh, you can go ahead and uh, uh, let us know who you are, uh, your affiliation, and I'll be happy to open the discussion. Yes, right here. Uh, if you want, I know that they might be for the uh, the live stream. It might make it easier. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. My name is Andre Sobozo, and I'm a, a director for Vietnam Southeast Asia and Washington D.C. for the Interstate Traveler Company in Detroit. Now, my question is: Gee, it's a wonderful presentation. Thank you. <laughs> but my question is this: um, Do do um, you, you mentioned Snowden and mm -hmm. and you know how how he came to get what he and, and did what he did. Now, my my belief is, and I, I don't want to know if, if I'm technically right or not, according to your knowledge. Mm -hmm. My belief is that he uh, subjected the United States to a greatly increased danger of a successful um, attack on the United States uh, by making it, um, well, for example, made it more e easier for th our worst enemies to conceal themselves because they're so much more alerted about our capabilities. And that was a point that Hayden made. Mm -hmm. And I just, based on what I know, much less than you, I agree with it. The question is, more important, <laughs> do you agree with that? Um, Look, it's, it's hard to imagine that in the, the volume of information that Snowden disclosed that there were not some operational clues and maybe even more than clues that were given away to our adversaries. And, you know, I think if you took a poll of people in the intelligence community about how they feel about Snowden, it would be somewhere between, you know, traitor and worse. Um, and, and we should emphasize that we're taking a lot of cues into how bad the damage was from people in the intelligence community, who obviously have a very vested interest in describing it as dire and awful. Um, the truth is the capabilities are revealed all the time in lots of ways. There were a lot of capabilities potentially revealed in this way all at once. Um, so the answer, not to try and you know, back out of this, but I, I, I cannot tell you how much more at risk we are because of those disclosures, although I assume that there was a level of operational detail disclosed. Now, one data point that I can sort of look at that tends to make me think that maybe the damage was not as severe as some would paint it out to be. Um, if you look at what's going on right now with our, our uh, campaign against ISIS, remember ISIS is the next generation of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq is the group that we basically you know, disassembled and destroyed using very powerful intelligence collection methods. Those are not working as well right now against ISIS, and the reason for that, according to U.S. officials, is they are uh, very good about staying off the phones. They are very good about stripping out any uh, information about their location when they send a tweet or they upload a video on YouTube. They are using technology that erases instant messages soon after they've been sent. I don't think that they needed to read the Snowden files to figure out that in the, days, in the age that we live in now that your communications can be intercepted and monitored. And I think that this generation of fighters is probably savvier than the ones that went before them and maybe went to school, frankly, on what happened to, to, to the guys who came before them. So all of that's a kind of a roundabout way of saying that your adversary is always going to get ahead of your capabilities. And I think that's what's happened here as well. And I don't think that we can fully blame that on the Snowden disclosures. Yeah. Uh, yes, over here in the corner. And I'll come back to you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation, uh, which is very wonderful. Um, I'm a research fellow from Taiwan at CSIS. Um, I have a, two questions. Um, the first one is um, when we see um, cyberspace as a battleground, as you mentioned earlier, um, how can we identify the boundary between a uh, rear line and the front line? Uh, that's the first question. The second question is, um, uh, it is arguable that um, when we see uh, in the physical world, uh, we have uh, three major conflicts. The first one is, um, I would say, um, crime in society. Uh, the second one is uh, terrorism in the world. And the third one is war. Um, but uh, that, that will be um, dealt with in different actors. For instance, like war is dealt with by uh, military soldiers and the countries. But in cyberspace, when these three uh, major conflicts has been um, combined together in cyberspace as a cyber terrorism, cyber crime, cyber uh, war, 
um, how can how can we identify different actors who is responsible for dealing with uh, these three different matters? Thank you. Yeah. So on the question of you know sort of where where is the front line and where is behind the front line? I mean the, the front line could be anywhere. I mean the front line could be on Sony's networks. The front line could be in a defense contractor's network. Um, and that's one of the more sort of confounding aspects of this, particularly when you're talking about trying to come up with, well, what are the rules of cyber war? <laughs> you know, who is a combatant? Uh, you know, where is the front? Uh, and that's been a really confounding issue. And I think is one of sort of one of the dimensions of this that maybe. Um, we should be, I think that probably people in the military are trying less to solve more than just sort of live within that ambiguity. Um, on, on the question of, you know, how do you to distinguish, I guess, war from crime, from terrorism, you know, it's something that's really important in cyber, and, you know, and I, I was conscious of the fact that when I'm using the word war in a book about cyber, there are lots of people who will look at this and say, most of the things, the bad things that are going on in cyberspace certainly do not constitute an act of war. Uh, and I would agree with that. And I think it's important that we sort of make these distinctions. Um, I think President Obama tried to do that in describing the Sony hack as an act of, I think he used the word cyber vandalism, which is sort of now kind of like we're, we're parsing the language even more. But that's probably ultimately to the good that we'd be more specific. Um, in terms of the, the holding people to account, I'll, I'll just say two things. From a legal perspective, it's extremely difficult. You know, the Justice Department recently indicted five Chinese military officials for a hacking campaign against U.S. companies. It's the tip of the iceberg, and these men will never see the inside of a courtroom. It's a largely symbolic act. But what this does point to is the fact that the U.S. government has gotten very good at finding out who is behind these attacks. You'll often hear in, in cybersecurity people saying the, things like the attribution problem. Well, how can we know for sure that this hacker was in China or was in North Korea or was in Russia or wherever he or she may be? And I read a lot about this in detail in the book. Um, the government is a lot better than they might lead you to believe at finding out who those people are. And we saw a piece of that, frankly, with the Sony hack when the FBI came out. The FBI director came out and said, I am confident about very few things in life, and I am very confident that North Korea is behind the Sony hack. We know that, not to give away too much of what's in the book, because we are inside North Korea's networks, and because we are spying on them, and we can see what they're doing. Uh, and we, we have built up a, a great reservoir of intelligence and information about what our adversaries are doing. Um, the bigger, harder question is, what do we do about it? Yes, ma'am, you had your hand up in the back, so I'm gonna go to you. Do you want to take the mic? Yeah. With NSA. Sorry, oh. so he wants to. Okay. Rand Paul wants to do away with NSA. Uh, how do you feel about that? <laughs> I'm not sure that he said he wanted to do away with it or not, but I'll take your word for it that I know he's got very strong opinions on it. Um, <clears throat> you know, look, uh, you know, I argue in the book. Um, it's always sort of daunting when, as a journalist who is not supposed to take policy positions, you start to write a book and suddenly, you know, your editors force you to sort of opine and say, well, what do you think we should do about this? I think there's a lot of wisdom in the suggestion that the president's advisors made in the post-Snowden panel for looking at how do you clarify or, or maybe even to some degree break up NSA's mission. We can't not have a national security agency. I mean, that would, it, it's just, it would be foolish to do that, I think. Um, but you have this problem where an agency is on the one hand tasked with breaking into computer networks, offense, and trying to protect computer networks, defense. And sometimes, as I, as I talked about earlier, those two missions come into direct conflict with each other. I think that we can do a better job of sorting out when those conflicts happen, how they get decided in the best interest of US national security. And I'm, I'm not frankly sure that they are. Um, but I just don't detect any real appetite, frankly, right now in this administration for asking those questions and for changing much of anything. That may come in the next administration. Um, it will certainly be forced when we have to start making harder decisions about when we attack versus when we defend and, and how we respond to aggressive acts. Um, we're at the very beginning of this discussion and debate, and it's going to get forced when more of these uh, um, attacks like the Sony attack, frankly, become publicly known. Yes, uh, yes, sir. John Kelly from the National Defense University. Um, I guess the question I have is within the architecture of the intelligence community and the people who are listening and performing all of these operations that you're talking about, is there a way to create an ombudsman or someone who could listen and where would you see that, listen to what the abuses are, and where would you see that placed within the architecture of the 
intelligence community? Yeah, it's, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great idea. Uh, you know, there's legislation pending before Congress now to sort of start getting at this idea with some, some reforms to the way the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court operates, which is the one that, of course, authorizes foreign intelligence gathering. Um, but that doesn't get you at the question of the, the, the broader pictures of you know, cyber warfare and conflict. Ultimately, I think this is a decision, these policy decisions that, that rest in the White House. And I think there's a, you, you probably could put a lot of those functions within the National Security Advisor. I mean, to the extent that that individual is supposed to be a gatekeeper and supposed to the president and also supposed to manage all these different equities of national security, it seems to me that would be a logical place to put somebody who has to sort of watch over it and make decisions about what the priorities are. Now, in terms of an independent ombudsman and, and oversight, you know, boy, would I like to see, you know, inspectors general at all of the intelligence agencies given a lot more teeth. Um, that's probably not a... Uh, a likely outcome. But I think that, you know, you could put a lot more authority in the National Security Advisor to, to, to sort of draw the rules of the road a bit more. But this, these are decisions that the pre a president is going to have to make and, 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 and will um, be confronting more and more. I'm going to go over here. Yeah. Hi, Melissa from Ditcha. Um, you've spoken very uh, forcefully about how this is an attack and, and this is a new domain, yet the president and is coming out saying this is cyber vandalism. Mm. There seems to be a disconnect between the two narratives that are being put forth. Is this the next domain of warfare or is this vandalism? And why would they choose to downplay it um, and not really confront it as uh, as great a threat as it's being uh, made out to be. I think it, uh, there's a lot we still don't know about why the administration responded the way it did, and there's a lot that's that is confusing about it to my mind. So on the one hand, he's calling it vandalism, but we're imposing economic sanctions on them for you know um, uh, the FBI is responding to this not just as an act of you know cr a criminal act, but as an intelligence gathering operation. It's been described as destructive. Well, what exactly did they destroy? Um, what I know from talking to people who are close to the investigation is that the initial sort of panic is too strong a word, but the conundrum that the White House faced was not, can we attribute the attack to North Korea? Um, I, and I don't think it was because they knew that. And I don't even think it was, well, what exactly was the damage that they did? It was, what should the policy be on responding to things like this, particularly when they become publicly known? And I think that if the attack had caused some physical damage, if they, rather than attacking Sony, they had attacked you know, a, a power station in California. Um, if you look at the existing sort of documentation on this and the writings that have been coming out of DOD for a number of years, I think they would view that as an act of war. That would be an, you know, a kinetic act, as the military calls it. Uh, and you would see a very different response. In fact, you know, that if, uh, an attack on critical infrastructure in the United States is something that the military has said. They would recommend to the president that he has the option of responding in cyber or not in cyberspace to that kind of act. But you know, the Sony attack, to, to me, it, it's confounding because, well, if it's vandalism, then why did it require a national response? And why did it get elevated to that level? And I think, frankly, we're sort of seeing people improvise here. Uh, a little bit, and I, I, I certainly don't think that it's completely coherent, but the next time maybe it will be a little more coherent, one hopes. <laughs> I'm going to come over here. Yes, sir. Just to continue speculating on the same lines, if the North Koreans did attack Sony, and if it was an act of war, we signed the North Atlantic Treaty. If we are attacked, there are a lot of other countries that are required to now defend us. I wonder if that enters into the calculus, and I wonder if it would enter into the calculus in a different way if the attack were on a critical infrastructure, say the financial, yeah. but not kinetic. Yeah. Um, to, to, to your second question, I think, yes, it probably would. Um, and there's a very telling moment, um, and I write about this in the book, uh, in 2007 when President Bush is meeting with his, <clears throat> uh, his National Security Council, and the Director of National Intelligence at the time, Mike McConnell, who used to run the NSA, says if the hackers on 9-11, rather than flying planes into buildings, had broken into the networks of a major bank or a financial exchange and corrupted the data, you know, erased it, manipulated it in such a way that the institution could no longer have confidence in its accuracy and transactions could no longer be processed, you would have a ripple effect and a panic 
essentially, would be ignited. And he said the economic consequences of that event would be worse than the economic consequences of the physical attack. And Bush is sort of incredulous about this, and he turns to Henry Paulson, his Treasury Secretary at the time, who of course used to be the CEO of Goldman Sachs, and says, Hank, is this true? And he says, not only is it true, but when I was running Goldman, this was the thing that kept me up at night. And it's this sort of light bulb that goes off in Bush's mind that compels him to start taking cybersecurity seriously. And he says that he'll launch a Manhattan project if he has to, to, to solve the problem. So yes, you can have an, an, an attack or an event that does not have a quote unquote kinetic outcome, but would nevertheless, I think, be seen by any president as something tantamount to an act of war that would necessitate a response, certainly justify. Um, uh, the first part of your question was, remind me, the treaty obligations. So NATO has now incorporated cyber attack into the treaty structure, such that a cyber attack on a member state can trigger the collective response. The question is, what's an attack? And then we were talking about this with some, with some, uh, some folks uh, earlier before the, re the reception. Um, that to me almost seems like a question that maybe is a little scary to answer. Uh, and probably we're gonna maybe not try to answer in advance because it gives you the flexibility to say, well, you know, maybe this is an attack and maybe it's not. And I think frankly, it's one reason why in the Sony case, President Obama w was I think deliberately not using the word attack. In fact, I'm fairly sure if you go back and look at it, he didn't use the word attack and he certainly didn't use the word act of war. So there's an instinct to kind of de-escalate this, I think, rhetorically, because the rhetoric has real consequences. Yes, ma'am. Oh, here it comes. It's okay. Uh, Victoria Feinberg, I retired from the Department of Defense, and as a former DOD employee, I'm curious, how did you deal with the classified information? Yeah. Without classified information, your book would lose a lot of interesting stuff. <laughs> On the other hand, by re revealing it, you probably faced some challenges. Yeah. Um, well, there is a surprising amount of information in the public record. It's one of the things that I was sort of struck by as I really got into the research. Um, there are a number of speeches, there are a number of papers that have put out, and again, and largely by the, the DOD and largely by the military. Um, where they lay out in pretty exceptional detail a lot of the thinking, a lot of the policy as it's being formulated, a lot of the structure of what our cyber forces look like right now, and I read about that in the book. Um, but to a large extent, I did rely on um, people who have who were the operators, you know, people who were in Iraq, people who worked on operations in Libya, where we did some of these kinds of things, and who've kind of worked on the trenches of that. Um, and, you know, and that is where I think just um, sort of classic shoe leather reporting comes in uh, and, and relying on, uh, uh, on uh, sources and being people that you can just, uh, corroborate their information and also um, sources that I have to treat confidentially. I, mean, I write about this in the beginning. My editor actually was insistent that because there were so many anonymous sources in the book, he said you need to put a note at the front of the book explaining why there are so many anonymous sources in your book. Um, and it, it, I think it, you know, it needs to be said too that this is a very risky time for uh, people to be talking to journalists. Um, there was a former CIA employee who was just convicted yesterday uh, after a very long uh, court battle of um, leaking to a prominent uh, journalist here in Washington. Um, and I definitely see it in people I talk to um, uh, that <clears throat> they are much more reluctant to, uh, to talk to journalists. Um, oddly enough, the Snowden leaks have caused some more senior officials to be a lot more candid um, because they sort of feel the need to defend themselves. Um, but it, it's a real challenge, and I think that in, you know, in national security reporting, as you know, some people in this room know well, um, we have to be able to rely on our pledges of confidentiality to our sources, and it's always my preference to be able to to, to, to name people and give you a sense of, of who they are and why they know what they do. And even when I can't identify them by name in the book, I try and give you a sense of why you should take what they're saying seriously. Yes, sir, all the way in the back. Now I'll go to you next. So go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I study the future of transportation energy, and I'm wondering how this affects the practicality of self-driving cars and also the Internet of Things, which is yeah. supposed to coordinate consumer products in the future? Yeah, I think it bears directly on, on, on the security of the Internet of Things. I mean, you know, it's, um, it's interesting. That, that phrase has taken on a lot of currency among defense contractors. And we're just sort of now kind of getting growing. The idea, that's gonna, you know, um, 
driverless cars and your thermostat and your refrigerator hooked up to the internet and your phone. This is kind of what we mean by internet of things and consumers are starting to, to get a sense of that. But, you know, it, it, large DOD contractors, they've been talking about it for quite some time. And what, and what they're so it was sort of, on the one hand, scaring them, but also is creating a business is every time you add something like this to the network, you've just increased, you know, the multiple points that you can attack. And the interdependencies of those technologies are profound. You know, it's the GPS system that controls the car. It's the industrial control system that controls the, the, the generator at the power station. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a hell of a problem. And I mean, and there, and you, but they, what I find so sort of, you know, I guess the, the ultimate truth about this is we're not going to pull the emergency brake on that, right? We're not going to stop adding things to the internet. We're not going to decrease our dependency on cyberspace. It's only going to go up. Um, you know, the, the book is sort of, I'll say it's, it's, it's not short on policy solutions, but it's sort of more like imagining how you might create a safer and more secure internet, which I, I won't go into here. But, you know, it's, it's almost more in the realm of speculation because I think we're not doing a great job, frankly, of securing that internet of things. And we, we're kind of short on good ideas for how to do that right now. Yeah. So I'm going all the way to the back because you had your hand up. Right behind you, ma'am. Nope, right there. There you go. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, sure. Andrew is uh, is extraordinary, so I really appreciate him having you uh, having you here tonight. Um, could you look at the degree to which uh, Saudi Aramco and um, excuse me the Georgia crisis really put uh, U.S. intelligence and the military in, in sort of a come to Jesus moment? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. So the in, in, in the Georgia incident is when. Um, uh, the Russians used offensive cyber against Georgia in their military campaign. That was certainly a moment where I think people in the U.S. military said, aha, these two things are going to be combined. The kinetic and the cyber are going to start going together. Um, but it was not the first time that it ever happened. I mean, in the Balkans campaign, we had some cyber elements. Um, uh, we were getting into the air traffic control and uh, 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 air defense systems there, uh, in Serbia and sort of faking out their radars and making them think that planes were coming from one direction when they were coming from another. Sort of classic sort of deception techniques and information techniques. But, you know, certainly the, what happened in Georgia kind of elevated this to, to a degree. Uh, and Saudi Aramco is another sort of one of those data points that people like to look at uh, and say this was an event where um, um, hackers got into a, a Saudi Arabian oil company and wiped off the data on about 30,000 computers and just caused tremendous amount of damage to institutionally to the organization. Um, and sort of analogous to what happened with Sony, where data was wiped off. Um, that was another one that I think U.S. officials like to point to. You know, the, the, the benefit of things, of bad things happening in the world, is you get to hold them up and kind of scare people <laughs> with them. But in this case, it was certainly pointing to real bad things that could happen and that were likely to happen. Uh, what I think is interesting about something like the Georgia case is, you know, why are we so fascinated by that? Well, we're doing it too. You know, we love to come out and talk about all the ways that people are doing awful and nefarious things to us, uh, you know, and they are, but we're also very good at doing it to them. So our understanding of the ways that we're vulnerable is really kind of predicated on how good we are at attacking other people too. Yeah. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Stefan Grober with Euronews, European Television. I want to come back to this uh, North Korean uh, Sony thing, um, which I found most uh, frightening. Um, and I wonder um, what your assessment is of the North Korean cyber uh, capabilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about a country that is, by all standards, one of the poorest in the world. Yeah. They can't feed the population. Uh, they can't run the power grids 24-7. This country should be capable of launching a cyber attack against the United States? Is that, is that serious? I mean, is, or are we so weak? I mean, that's most troubling. Right? Yeah. It, what's, your, what's your take on this? Well, the experts who've looked at the Sony hack, I think would say um, that it probably wasn't all that sophisticated, right? I mean, it took advantage of some, of some pretty basic techniques for getting inside of a network. Um, and, and uh, you know, what I think is sort of more interesting about the Sony attack is the sort of the, the political offensive nature of it, the way that they sort of decided to use this, uh, you know, if we believe, you know, the complete narrative. I'm not saying I doubt that it came from North Korea or was directed by North Korea. Um, but, you know, it, it, to the extent that they were using this as a way to try and cause uh, to silence free speech or something like that. That's more of a political kind of act and, and one that seems to me that they're pretty adept at. But you're on to something here, which is that, you know, this is a country that only has something like 1,300 internet addresses in the country. 
You know, when the internet went out in North Korea after the Sony attack, I mean, it was like shutting the light off in a room, not like shutting off the power grid. Uh, it, it's a fairly trivial thing to do to knock them down. I think what it underscores, <clears throat> whether North Korea did this or whether they kind of outsourced it to, you know, to a private group, is that, you know, the barrier to entry to getting into cyberspace and causing some real damage is, is trivially low compared to building an army or an air force or a navy, which is not to say that something like the Stuxnet attack that we in Israel launched against Iran was trivial. It could take, it probably took years to plan. Um, but countries can do a fairly significant amount of damage or at least cause a lot of havoc and really sort of muck things up with some fairly unsophisticated operations. And I think that's probably what happened in the Sony case. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question about uh, uh, if you consider that the everything we have in life has a has some has a, has two two dimension, an upper and one, and one that is maybe a little more hidden. If you take the internet, which is now at the uh, the domain of the virtual, uh, all the things that happen in real life. Uh, can you think about uh, the same thing happening at the virtual level with real people? Uh, you talk about at war. Uh, can you think about a war happening now against the US or worldwide uh, conducted by spiritual being based on what we see on the internet? which will be just as parable. Well, I guess I'm not sure I fully understand the answer, but I guess if, if the question is, can you imagine wars that don't take place in the physical space that we understand and more in this sort of cyber dimension, I mean, I think increasingly the line between the two of those is becoming blurred. Um, so, you know, you can see events that happen in cyberspace that have a real world outcome. And it's important to remember that Probably the, the purest definition of cyber war or cyber attack, certainly from the military's point of view, would be something that happens in cyberspace that has a real world outcome. So Stuxnet, you create a computer program that disables a piece of physical infrastructure. Um, but those two lines are blurring all the time and it's sort of one of the fun things to play with in the book, particularly at the end where I'm sort of trying to imagine what the internet of the future looks like. And you know, I, I tell people, particularly young people who are sort of starting out in computer science, you know, if you really want to get into you know, a, a, a sort of completely new dimension of thinking and challenger thinking. Cybersecurity is a growth industry for that reason. Yeah, let me come over here. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hmm? Hi, Tim Rada from the German Marshall Fund. Thanks for the presentation. Um, in your reporting, or and also in, I'm curious about your opinion, have you heard much about uh, switching to a web 2.0 or creating <clears throat> creating other protocols perhaps separate networks from for critical infrastructure that are completely delinked from the main global internet do you see you know do you see that as something that is gaining interest or what are your thoughts on that yeah i actually at the very at the end of the book when i'm sort of imagining you know, what would a safer s cyberspace look like? It's predicated on that very idea of would you kind of create separate networks entirely, which the military has done, by the way. The military runs global networks that are not connected to the internet. Um, plenty of people have said, why are we connecting industrial control systems that control power grids to the internet? That just seems crazy to some people. Um, but I often wonder too, whether or not you could take the existing internet and sort of break it up into "Quote unquote safer zones," and you know, and this is this is highly speculative, and I'm sure technologists out there will probably tell me that there's no way you could actually do it. But I just wonder if you could almost create sort of like a gated community on some portion of the internet, where you put your banking and your Amazon and all the things that you depend upon every day, and the price to enter in there is basically your anonymity. Uh, it, it's it's you have to identify who you are, where you are, what is your computer. You have to be vetted and trusted, and you can operate in that space but you will have essentially no privacy, no anonymity whatsoever, but the trade-off is that you get a higher degree of security, more monitoring, and some level of assurance there. And I wonder if maybe we're heading towards sort of creating these sort of clean zones and dirty zones on the internet, and that the cleaner zones will just be more heavily surveilled and monitored, even if they're not physically distinct. Yes. Uh, Shane, just an absolutely superb presentation. Thanks. Uh, Tom Goldberg with Lineage. I'm just going to make a quick comment on the last question. Harris Corporation brought up uh, 
some fiber optic uh, unused cables in the United States is trying to sell that out to industrialists for that very purpose regarding your question. The second one, which is uh, rather interesting, is that the Brazilians are running their own fiber optic to Europe to get around the switching and connectivity through the United States. So getting to Shane's point, it's becoming a reality. It's a little slow, and like everything else that yeah. you've described, it's, uh, uh, you know, fits and starts. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am, right here. Thanks. I'm Lindsay Gorman from the National Academy of Sciences. Um, thank you so much for the great presentation. Um, I'm wondering about the question of public-private partnerships, particularly as it relates to talent sourcing. Um, mm -hmm. You mentioned that the cyberspace is no longer the province of the geeks, but the reality is that at the, the highest levels of technical competence, it is still the province of, of that uh, part of the population, yeah, yeah. which uh -huh. historically has, has not been the most inclined towards military service. So <laughs> how do you see the prospects for, for talent sourcing uh, to match these budgetary increases, yeah, it, particularly in the military context? It, it, it's hard, and I think it's harder after Snowden. I mean, Keith Alexander, who was the, before Admiral Rogers, the director of the NSA, the longest serving director, famously a couple years ago went to the big hacker conferences in Las Vegas and took off the uniform and put on these black jeans and a t-shirt, you know, tried to sort of say, I'm one of you, and sort of said, you know, come join us, you know, participate in this. Um, and, and obviously the government's credibility is, is pretty low <laughs> among a lot of those groups. But on the positive side, not to paint too bleak, bleak of a picture, at the really, really high end uh, sort of of, the, of, the, of the, the cyber offense scale, let's take it, where you have the really exquisite hackers. I guess the good thing is that you don't need as many of them as you need sort of lower down and more of the defensive and sort of more of the systems administrative kind of thing. So that's one. So you can think about, you know, maybe the, the requirement to find numbers is not as great at the top as it is skill. Um, the military and the intelligence community's basic pitch to people who want to work in this area is, yes, cybersecurity is a huge growing area in the private sector, but you will get to do really cool and fascinating things working for your government that you would never be able to do otherwise. Um, I'm not sure that's entirely true because a lot of private companies out there do pretty cool things too and are doing a lot more of them and frankly, in some cases, know as much about foreign hacking as or you know, significantly equal to what the, what the US government knows. Um, but this is not stopping NSA in particular from going out and recruiting. Um, the agency has a program. We'll, we're, we'll pay for your four-year education to get a computer or a science degree uh, to come work for the agency, and you pay it off by working for the agency for four years. It's a pretty, they, they are helping to write curriculum uh, at universities. Um, they are always going to face the challenge that they cannot pay. The government, the military cannot pay private sector salaries. Uh, I met one person actually after the book was finished who went through one of these four-year programs, did his time in the NSA, and then he went out to Silicon Valley and did a startup where he's now a contractor for the National Security Agency. So I suppose like the model might be like, okay, if you're going to go be a contractor, just make sure you're one for us. Um, but th th this is where the public-private partnership part comes in. The intelligence community is going to have to depend upon expertise in the private sector. It's just, it's just inevitable. Um, more people are going to go there, they're going to be paid more, and they're going to find the work as appealing. And I think the intelligence community gets that. They, they do. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Yes. Hello, my name is Richie Abel. I'm a student at American University. And the implications of cybersecurity are definitely intense. We've talked about warfare, collapse of financial systems. Do you think it's time that the United States backs down and lets an international response to this, a more multilateral response to cyber defense? The internet is an international issue. Does it require an international response, or are we better off on our own? Yeah, well, it kind of begs the question of, like, could we head towards something like a a treaty, maybe. And we got this a little bit when we talk about NATO, but if we went broadly more like, is there a cyber warfare treaty to be had? Um, I think the answer to that candidly is no, because there's very little incentive for other countries to abide by these rules, and how would you verify it? It'd be very, very hard to verify that kind of a treaty. I think what's more likely is that sort of rules of behavior and the norms are going to develop over time, and it's going to be very messy. Um, you know, I think that probably it, it, it certainly, uh, if, if it didn't occur to President Obama at the time, it certainly has since the December 19th uh, speech that he gave where he identified North Korea as responsible for the Sony hack. Um, how we respond to these events 
is going to set rules of behavior norms, not just for us, but for other countries. And we are setting precedents every time that we go out and respond to one of these events. It's one reason why I think we like to do a lot of this secretly, is because when these things get exposed, you have this problem of precedent being set. Um, there was a very telling story last year, I think it was when Secretary Hagel went to China uh, with the military delegation and they sat down with their counterparts in China and said, we wanna talk to you about what are the rules of, you know, what are the kinds of aggressive acts that we see in cyberspace happening that we would respond to? What, what is sort of, you know, the tit for tat? How would we, you know, formulate? How would we signal to each other what our attentions are? And they laid out some of them for the Chinese delegation and the Chinese said essentially, thank you very much and the meeting is over and we're not going to tell you ours. Um, so this is, this is tough. I mean, you're getting at really, I think, one of the more intractable problems in this, uh, and, and I don't have the answers to that, but I, I know that we're, we're gonna get there through collective behavior and action and reaction, and it's gonna be messy and ugly and contradictory, and hopefully it'll all be clear on the other side, <laughs> and that'll be the third book. <laughs> all right, thanks very much, okay.